it ain't the left side or the right side, then it must be the fin side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. Also, check out our merch store, onthefinside.threadless.com. Week one of NFL free agency is in the books. We have a, we have a couple of comings, a, a lot of goings, and we'll break down those here in this segment as we approach the NFL draft as these rosters start to take shape. So we'll go down position by position here. We'll start at, at the top here at the quarterback spot, which is also happens to be our biggest news, too. So the Dolphins do trade Ryan Tannehill to the Tennessee Titans, and we could go back and forth on dead money and all this other financial mumbo-jumbo, but the truth is this: the Dolphins are eating $5 million this year to get Ryan Tannehill off the books. They'll move down from the sixth round to the seventh round in the NFL draft this upcoming year while getting a fourth round pick next year. So, Paul, what what was your initial reaction to this and to the Dolphins' new quarterback, Ryan Fitzpatrick? At first, I was a little bit saddened. I mean, it is the end of an era. Uh, And on top of that, Miami didn't really have an answer in place at, at, at that point in time. So, you know me, you know, I was big on you keep Tannehill unless somebody blows you away until you have the replacement lined up and they didn't have it. So I was a little bit nervous. It was like, Oh God, we don't have a line or a quarterback, which I know we'll get to the line piece with all these great skill position players around that lack thereof. But I will say that the, the other fly in the ointment there was the Teddy Bridgewater joke this week where Teddy supposedly might have been spurning New Orleans to come to Miami. I learned everything I need to know about Teddy Bridgewater when he gave up the opportunity to be a starter with some good skill position players to go and be a backup for Drew Brees, who's not retiring anytime soon. You know what? I want a guy that wants to play. And if he doesn't want to start and wants to make his free money for watching from the sidelines, good for you, Teddy. Enjoy your career or lack thereof. Yeah, but the word on the street. As, oh, go ahead. Word on the street was that Teddy Bridgewater wanted sixteen million a year to come to Miami, and I I would have thrown up on myself if if that were the case. I I don't understand really what the big deal is about this guy. I would have been totally fine if he came here for the same amount of money the Dolphins gave Ryan Fitzpatrick, which was two years, eleven million, could earn up to twenty million with incentives. I would have been fine with that, but. I don't understand what the big deal otherwise is uh, because he he's thrown what 30 passes in the last two or three years. And in his first two years before he had that, that terrible injury, he only had 28 touchdowns and or, yeah, 28 touchdowns and 21 interceptions. So it's not like we're talking about a, a blue chip talent here. And I thought if the dolphins had signed Bridgewater or Tyrod Taylor, those are the quarterbacks that are going to get you to six to eight wins. Ryan Fitzpatrick could catch fire, uh, or he could be so bad that the Dolphins could go two and 14, and then you get that top pick in the draft. So I I don't think there's an in-between with Ryan Fitzpatrick, where I think Taylor and Bridgewater were all in between. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) Ryan Fitzpatrick, let's face it, I think you're right on both counts. I think we're going to see stretches this coming season where, you know, he's he's the second coming of Marino or Montana. And we're going to see stretches this season where he's the second coming of Brock Osweiler. I mean, it, it, he is so ridiculously streaky. But you know what? Miami's hoarding all the Fitz magic out there by bringing UConn Cornelius into the fold. And uh, I'm happy with that move. I think it makes a lot of sense. And he's also accustomed to being that guy that kind of holds the reins until the young guy is ready. So we're getting somebody with that. If Teddy Bridgewater's coming in here asking for $16 million a year, he's not asking to hold the reins for you until somebody comes in. He's asking to keep the reins no matter what. And I, that's not what Teddy Bridgewater was going to be. So I'm fine with that, too. I mean, it, it's – yeah, I think Miami's going after that young quarterback in the draft either this year or next. So Fitzpatrick makes a hell of a lot of sense. Look at it his stats last year, the first three games, he was the talk of the NFL. I mean, he had 
11 touchdowns and three interceptions in the first three games. But the remaining five, and he was in and out of the lineup with Jameis Winston, he had some really bad games, too. Nine for 18 for 126 yards and an interception. He also had his final two games, 29 for 41, 406 yards but two picks in that legendary game. How do you throw for 400 yards and score three points? I don't know. And then his final game, he's 13 for 21, 167 yards, no touchdowns, three interceptions. So the bad was really bad, and the good was really good. So which one we get? You never know, but the good thing with Fitzpatrick is a lot of times he plays really well the first year he's with another team. So we'll see if that takes shape here this year. Let's go down the rest of the positions here, Paul. At running back, kind of a little heartbreaker here. You know, two guys we liked a lot. Frank Gore goes to Buffalo, one year, two million. Brandon Bolden, I'm not quite sure what he got there from the Patriots. I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of three years, nine million. But two guys we could have easily seen back. But the Dolphins may end up getting a comp pick in the seventh round for one of them. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's funny because Brandon Bolden was probably the one of the two that I would have preferred to have back. I really liked the exciting flashes I saw from him as a move piece last year. And, you know, while I'm excited to get that seventh round pick next year, I would have been more excited to have a guy that seemed to do something special a lot of the time he was on the field last season, back in the fold, inexpensively at about $3 million a year. I'll take that all day. So, yeah, I mean, Frank Gore, I like Frank Gore, but I could take him or leave him at this point in his career. I mean, he was good last year, but he wasn't special to me. I mean, he, he put out your numbers, but he was keeping better, more exciting players off the field. More exciting for sure, and I think that's what needs to happen in a year like this. Kenyon Drake is going to be a free agent after the 2019 season, believe it or not. And we got to see what we have from Kalen Balaj too. And you never know, the Dolphins could end up, you know, that fourth round seems to be pretty magical for them to get in terms of getting a running back. So you could see that here as well. At wide receiver, definitely the first big surprise of free agency. I don't think any of us even considered the possibility Devontae Parker would be back. It was expected that that fifth year was going to be rescinded where he was at nine point four million. But then we hear that he signs a contract two years, $13 million, gets really in that context a little bit of a pay cut in terms of what he was thinking about getting this year. But it looks like the new regime is going to give this give him an opportunity. Yeah, they're tickled over the promise that Devontae Parker shows in a few games a year. I mean, we're still waiting for him to have that breakout. I don't trust he's ever going to have it at this point. I mean, at least not consistently. And he does have a tendency to cause a lot of turnovers. So very curious to see how that turns out with Parker here. I mean, he's so all over the map. Well, the good news on that is if you take a look at what some of these other wide receivers got paid in free agency, let's just look at our own division. John Brown, who's never had a thousand yard season, gets nine million a year from the Bills. And Cole Beasley, a five foot eight, hundred and eighty pounds. 30-year-old slot receiver coming off a 675-yard season gets seven and a half million. Devontae Parker, at best, is going to get six and a half. So if if you think of it in terms of third or fourth receiver type of money, then I'm fine with it. Uh, And I this is actually from a value standpoint a move that I really liked uh, on here. Look, I I know Parker has not been living up to the promise to say the least over the last, gosh, I mean, really going back to his sophomore year at at Louisville was the last time he looked like that superstar. But maybe we don't need a superstar. Maybe we need a guy guy that can get down the field a little bit and make some plays, kind of in that Josh Gordon role uh, for the New England Patriots. Uh, Also, Danny Amendola was cut, no surprise, and I'm glad that the Dolphins saved $6 million there. So it looks like the Dolphins are going to head into the season, unless they draft a player, which I don't see, with those top four guys being Albert Wilson, Devontae Parker, Kenny Stills, Jakeem Grant, in no particular order. The tight end spot, it was a position we didn't expect much action from, and the Dolphins end up signing two guys. Dwayne Allen, two years, six and a half million. There was actually surprisingly a lot of competition for him. He played 400 snaps last year for the Patriots, only caught three passes, but he's more of a blocking tight end, too. Uh, my big problem with this signing is that I think he, he stands in the way 
of Durham Smythe, where I, I thought Smythe, when he got on the field last year, was a good inline blocker, and I think Allen prohibits that a little bit. They also, also signed Clive Wolford, his, who's bounced around between the Jets and the Raiders. So, I, Paul, I think this is a situation, too, where they're evaluating this whole roster and saying, you know what, uh, I didn't spend a second and a fourth round pick on those yep. guys last year. No, I agree with you. And it, it's kind of funny when you say they signed two, it felt like they signed about 12 of them the way it seemed to go with free agency this year. But in all reality, the tight end position outside of maybe Nick O'Leary was, was pretty underwhelming last year. I like, you know, I like Durham Smythe. Uh, wasn't the biggest Gasicki fan, but I gave him a chance. Hopefully he turns it on under the new regime. And they, well, some of that's going to be whether they use him appropriately or not, too. He really wasn't deployed in the way to be most effective last season. So, could be interesting. I mean, there's no names that blow you away. But, again, tight ends are a position that if you can be a contributing role player, there's a spot for you. So, we'll see what happens as, as training camp wears on this summer. Moving along to the offensive line and – I wanted the Dolphins to really do one thing this year, just one thing only this off season. If they did, if they completely did the exact opposite of what I said the rest of the time, I would have been fine with it. But this is when I had to dig my heels in. And, and I'm telling you, it's, it's actually getting unhealthy for me because I've, I'm fracturing relationships, uh, yelling at people. I mean, I'm, I'm not myself when you bring up this player, the Dolphins let you want James go. And he signs a four-year, $51 million contract with the Denver Broncos. I think a lot of people were surprised at the amount of money that he got. But, I, Paul, I just I look at it now and I say, the Dolphins really throughout this entire rebuild could have had Juwan James at one side, Laramie Tuns on the other side, and they don't have to feel guilty because there's not a franchise quarterback to pay, and there aren't a lot of players on the roster to pay uh, upcoming I mean, you got Tunzel, you got Xavier Howard, but it, it, that, that's not going to prohibit you from doing anything. And, and the Dolphins do have a lot of money here coming up. I'm very disappointed they did not get back Juwan James. I am too. And the Juwan James move felt like one that should have been done last offseason. We were kind of banging the boards for it. Uh, last offseason, they could have gotten a deal on him, which would have turned into a steal um, as as we go along here. But unfortunately – the last regime didn't have the value on him that he really should have had. And we're dealing with the repercussions of that now. Instead, they wanted to go out and sign overpriced free agents from outside the organization to come in and, and spot duty to the offensive line and instead left him twisting out the wind. And he went out and he made some top end money at the position. So congratulations, Juwan James. I'm sorry to see you go. I mean, he was a guy that I think you and I wanted signed well before he had the opportunity to test the free agency waters. And unfortunately he got that opportunity and he capitalized. Yeah. And he's getting paid more than Lane Johnson now. And you know, that mm -hmm. when you look at that on paper, it seems insane. And I, I'm not denying that the dolphins would have overpaid him, but I'm with you, Paul. They should have done it last off season. I think four years, 34 million would have got it done last off season. And he still would have been one of the highest paid right tackles. And, I'll reiterate again, it's 95% that I don't want to spend a first-round pick replacing Juwan James, who is already in the building. The only upside to this move here that I see is that the Dolphins should get a third-round compensatory pick next year for James because he, he did sign that four-year $51 million contract. But as it stands right now, after the Dolphins cut Josh Sitton on what is termed a failed physical – Man, oh, man, <laughs> they've got five offensive linemen on the roster right now with starting experience, and only three of those linemen, Tunzel, Kilgore, and Jesse Davis, have had more than two starts in their career. The other two players on the roster are Isaac Asiata and Zach Stirrup, and if you're starting either one of those to start the year, it's not looking good there. So, Paul, let's move on to the defensive side of the ball, and we need to start with all the respect in the world to Cameron Wake, who did sign a three-year, $23 million contract with the Tennessee Titans. He leaves Miami with 98 career sacks over 10 years after being signed by Jeff Ireland uh, from the CFL. 
kudos to this guy. I would love to have him back, but it didn't make a whole lot of sense at 37 years old. I was hoping that he would have gone to an NFC team like the Saints and maybe rejoining Ireland, who's in that front office. But didn't quite work out that way. 98 sacks over the last 10 years. If he gets eight this year, he'll pass former Dolphin Trace Armstrong for 25th all-time. Yeah, he's one of those guys that it's going to feel awful weird the first time I see him in a different uniform. I mean, it, it's there are some guys that can come and go. I mean, I like Juwan James, but I see him in a Broncos uniform and go, eh, I wish he was still here, but okay, I get it. You know, he got paid. But for Cameron Wake's sake, it really didn't make sense during a rebuild to bring back a 37-year-old pass rusher that's probably going to be making decent money. Not phenomenal money, but decent money with the team. So good on them for letting him go out and explore. And I'm really glad to see he wasn't one of those former players that was bashing Tannehill all over Twitter, only to have him follow him to the Titans. That would be <laughs> You know, it's, it's, let's face it. Uh, but, I mean, it does keep Tannehill as the only – one of the only quarterbacks Cam Wake hasn't sacked in the NFL. So, you know, there is that. But all kidding aside, I mean, best of luck to, to Cam Wake. Uh, I have nothing but love for him as a player, and he seems like such a wonderful, amazing human being that – I, I do. I can't help but wish him the best of luck. I mean, he gave everything he had the entire time he was in Miami for every snap. So, best wishes. Well said. Him. Well said. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to miss him too. So we'll see. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to be really hoping that he gets that he's, he he keeps piling on the sacks here for the Titans over the next couple of years. Because if he does, you know, he right now I'd say I'd say once he gets into the top twenty, twenty five in sacks of all time. He becomes a borderline Hall of Famer. If he plays two or three years where, where he can put 20 or 25 more sacks onto his total, I think he ends up going to Canton. So we will see on that. Another surprise, Paul, we always assumed Robert Quinn would be cut. I mean, we looked at his $12.9 million salary, and the Dolphins did something pretty interesting. They let that period pass, and they paid Robert Quinn a $1.1 million signing bonus that he was due. And we thought that he'd be cut right before that so they wouldn't have to pay. So now he's on the books for $11.8 million. Some people think that he's going to be a an edge player, whether that's 4-3, whether that's 3-4 with this new regime. Some people think, too, that the Dolphins are eating a little bit of that money to maybe turn around and trade him in this NFL that's going crazy over the pass rushers right now. What do you see happening? I'm a little bit in the camp with that 1.1 million making things a little more palatable. Um, but at the same time, he does have experience both having his hand in the dirt and, and backing up to that linebacker role. So this very well could be a scenario where Miami keeps him for a season with that hybrid three, four, four, three defense that they're talking about. And he might be performing exactly that because you can keep the same personnel on the field and do some intriguing things. I mean, do I think Quinn is a one trick pony that is, you know, feast or famine on any given Sunday? Absolutely. But do I like the idea of him playing when the only other option right now is Charles Harris? Absolutely. I mean, no qualms about that one. Um, you know, give me Quinn all day over Charles Harris. If, if, if push comes to shove. Yeah, when we were talking during the season, too, I remember the first six or seven games, Quinn, for the first about two and a half quarters, would be providing outstanding pass rush, but wouldn't yeah. get the sacks. I think he only had one sack in the first seven games. He finished the year with about six and a half. And it was just weird. And then the second half, he would completely disappear. And then in the last four or five games, it was almost like he was completely gassed. But I also blame a lot of that on the personnel. I can't stress enough that I don't think there was an issue with Quinn and Wake under normal terms getting to the quarterback or having the, the skills to do that. I think that when you take a look at, at what was going on last year, it was so obvious that these outside rushers were just teeing off on the quarterback. The quarterbacks were stepping up and wiping those defensive ends out of the play. So 
Hopefully Brian Flores and Patrick Graham get that figured out. I think what they're doing with Quinn here is, hey, if we're blown away, you know, if we get offered for Quinn, who's 28 years old, it feels like he's older. Say we get offered a second or a third round pick. I don't see that happening. By a desperate team that's looking to, to go over the top, then I think the Dolphins have the flexibility to make that trade. Or they can say, you know what, we're very happy – with Quinn putting pressure on the quarterback here for another year. So interesting to see. I think they made a pretty creative two-win scenario there, and they definitely have the money to pay Robert Quinn, too, if they decide to. Nothing really else to report at the linebacker spot. At cornerback, they did sign Eric Rowe one year, $3.5 million. The Dolphins are going to continue to add more and more defensive backs. He's played the last three seasons with the Patriots. But he's gotten hurt a lot, and he was he was on injured reserve halfway through the season last year. And when he was on the field, I didn't see a whole heck of a lot I liked. I saw a big cornerback who had a lot of passes caught off of him, got beat over the top a lot. Not the biggest fan of him, but, you know, for one year, three and a half million, he's got to be better than Torrey McTire, and that's really what the conversation's about. It is. I mean, it – I think we're still looking for that partner in crime for every down opposite Xavier Howard here. I don't think Eric Rowe is that answer. I don't think he's going to consistently be it for the season. But if Miami can have him for depth, I love the signing all day. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's really a scenario where I think he's a depth player overall, but he's somebody that, that Flores is familiar with. Yeah. Well said. So taking a look at the rest here, Paul, um, you know, we've talked about Quinn and we've seen a lot of trades that the Dolphins here have have made or or they're interested in making. A couple other guys that have that could be a possibility besides Quinn, Rashad Jones, Kenny Stills, Kiko Alonso. Um, Any of those out of those three guys, which ones would you keep? Which ones would you trade? Because if they do trade, it's going to be for a mid to late rounder. That was Rashad, Stills, and who was the third one? Kiko. Kiko. I'd trade Kiko for – hell, I'd trade him and give somebody a pick to take him. <laughs> yeah, me, too. I mean, me too, but this I, – I don't know what spell this guy has on on South Florida here, but yeah, he won over the last coaching staff, and it looks like that this coaching staff likes what they see too. I, I, I don't get it. I mean – I guess when he misses 17 tackles but then has an interception to make up and wipe all that four or five games of nastiness out that people forget about it. Yeah, I'm with you on that with Kiko. I would trade him for anything. Rashad Jones, honestly, I would I would gladly trade him for anything too. I mean, I, I'm still bitter over last year what he did in the Jets game. I've made no secret about that. But also, too, I don't see Rashad Jones being a player that's going to be here in two or three years. He's going to be 31 this year. and he certainly isn't what he was four or five years ago as a player. And as far as I'm concerned, as a person too. So, so you let, know, me, I, let me I'm, jump in here on that one real quick. Cause just thinking out loud, if you had the opportunity say to jump from 13, uh, say Kyler Murray does not go number one overall. Right. Mm-hmm. And you have the opportunity to jump from 13 to three and it costs you a first, a second, and Rashad Jones. Oh, that's that, that, that's without question. Uh, I say yes to that. And uh, but unfortunately, it's going to cost a lot more than that because if – Probably, if, but just speculation, you know. I, I would say if, if they were to jump and, – and I'm not denying – I mean, they, they could be in a scenario where if Murray – I mean, it's not the first pick, that they trade up to somewhere in that three to six range, but I think it would cost it would cost for that swap a second rounder, a third rounder, and probably next year's first rounder for that there. If if you could do that for the second rounder like you did for Deion Jordan a few years ago in that trade, then I think that that they'd make that all day. But with a quarterback on the board in a good draft year or decent draft year compared to two thousand thirteen where we got scorched, then probably not. But yeah, Rashad, I'd pretty well, much take anything. Uh, what, you know, what would you I, give he, up to move up there? I'm curious. Yeah, I just fe- like... that's, a, that's a good question. Do you see Kyler? If Kyler fell down to 
if Kyler fell down to three or four and they absolutely loved him, man, oh, man. Because, I mean, they they did do a private workout with him. They stayed behind instead of going to some of these others and really put him through the paces the day after his pro day. I, I, I tell you what, I, I would give up what I think it would cost, and that is uh, the second-round pick, probably a, another third or fourth-round pick this year and the first round or next year. I would give that up under this – feeling and this is what I would hope that they do is that we're going to give Kyler Murray even though we're trading up for him he gets two years and in 2021 if Dolphins are not a good football team it should be a stocked quarterback year two with Trevor Lawrence from Clemson and Tua might be in that draft too but he's probably going to be in 2020 so I, I think you've got to go up and get your quarterback if you love him and he represents that opportunity for you all right. Didn't mean to derail you. Keep, keep, keep on with Rashad and company there. Yeah, so uh, Kenny Stills is the last one here. You know, a lot of people are saying that, you know, I trade Kenny Stills for anything, too. I, I'm no. not in that camp there. Kenny Stills is 26 years old. Just last year we were talking about him being an elite deep threat. Maybe not a not the overall player, but, man, he can still get deep on people. He's 26 years old. I mean, the, again – if, if if Stills were 28, 29, like with Rashad Jones, I, I would be comfortable unloading him for pretty much anything you can get with where the Dolphins are. But now I would keep him on the roster for sure, unless you get blown away blown away by say a second round pick, which I don't see happening. I'm completely with you on that. I mean, it's you'd have to utterly blow me away with Stills. The big thing is, is the big thing being, I mean, it's getting more and more evident that Miami's plan in, in the draft this year, unless some freakish Kyler Murray thing happens, is to rebuild, restock the trenches and accumulate draft picks. That, that seems hands down to be what Miami's after this season. Yeah, and I, it wouldn't surprise me either if the Dolphins did trade down from 13 and continue to accumulate more picks. Speaking of next year, in the 2020 draft, as it stands right now, the Dolphins are slated to have 11 draft picks um, with the compensatory formula. They'll have all of their original picks. They're also expected to have a third-round pick for Juwan James, a fourth-round pick in the Ryan Tannehill trade, a fifth-round pick for Cameron Wake, and also, too, uh, they acquired a seventh-round pick for Jordan Lucas, who had a good season with the Chiefs after that trade. And it's quite possible, too, they get a seventh-round compensatory pick. But that's more likely to be wiped out with the Ryan Fitzpatrick signing. So it should they should be able to stockpile a lot there, and we're going to be sure to talk about those here, not only in this draft season, but, season, but next draft year as well. That will do it for our breakdown of the Miami Dolphins' week one in free agency. You're listening to Cat and Paul on the Fin side. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Check out our merch store on the thefinside.threadless.com. And if it's not on the right side, and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. Fin side. It ain't the left, left side, side or the right, right side, side, and it must be the fin side. Look, listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about to do.